chapter one of elizabethan sea dogs this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org elizabethan sea dogs by william wood chapter one england's first look in the early spring of fourteen hundred and seventy six the italian giovanni cabato who like christopher columbus was a seafaring citizen of genoa transferred his allegiance to venice the roman empire had fallen a thousand years before rome now held temporal sway only over the states of the church which were weak in armed force even when compared with the small republics dukedoms and principalities which lay north and south but papal rome as the head and heart of a spiritual empire was still a world power and the disunited italian states were first in the commercial enterprise of the age as well as in the glories of the renaissance north of the papal domain which cut the peninsula in two parts stood three renowned italian cities florence the capital of tuscany leading the world in arts genoa the home of cabato and columbus teaching the world the science of navigation and venice mistress of the great trade route between europe and asia controlling the world's commerce thus in becoming a citizen of venice giovanni cabato the genoese was leaving the best home of scientific navigation for the best home of sea-borne trade his very name was no bad credential surnames often come from nicknames and for a genoese to be called il cabato was as much as for an arab of the desert to be known to his people as the horseman capitaccio now means no more than coasting trade but before there was any real ocean commerce it referred to the regular seaborne trade of the time and giovanni cabato must have either upheld an exceptional family tradition or struck out an exceptional line for himself to have been known as john the skipper among the many other expert skippers hailing from the port of genoa there was nothing strange in his being naturalized in venice patriotism of the kind that keeps the citizen under the flag of his own country was hardly known outside of england france and spain though the italian states used to fight each other an individual italian especially when he was a sailor always felt at liberty to seek his fortune in any one of them or wherever he found his chance most tempting so the genoese giovanni became the venetian zuan without any patriotic wrench nor was even the vastly greater change to plain john cabot so very startling italian experts entered the service of a foreign monarch as easily as did the pay fighting swiss or hessian mercenaries columbus entered the spanish service under ferdinand and isabella just as cabot entered the english service under henry the seventh giovanni zuan john it was all in a good day's work cabot settled in bristol where the still existing guild of merchant venturers was even then two centuries old columbus writing of his visit to iceland says the english especially those of bristol go there with their merchandise iceland was then what newfoundland became the best of distant fishing grounds it marked one end of the line of english seaborne commerce the levant marked the other the baltic formed an important branch thus english trade already stretched out over all the main lines long before cabot's arrival a merchant prince of bristol named canning who employed a hundred artificers and eight hundred seamen was trading to iceland to the baltic and most of all to the mediterranean the trade with italian ports stood in high favour among english merchants and was encouraged by the king in fourteen hundred and eighty five the first year of the tudor dynasty 
an english consul took office at pisa and england made a treaty of reciprocity with tuscany henry the seventh first of the energetic tudors and grandfather of queen elizabeth was a thrifty and practical man some years before the event about to be recorded in these pages columbus had sent him a trusted brother with maps globes and quotations from plato to prove the existence of lands to the west henry had troubles of his own in england so he turned a deaf ear and lost a new world but after columbus had found america and the pope had divided all heathen countries between the crowns of spain and portugal henry decided to see what he could do anglo-american history begins on the fifth of march fourteen hundred and ninety six when the cabots father and three sons received the following patent from the king henry by the grace of god king of england and france and lord of ireland to all to whom these presents shall come greeting be it known that we have given and granted and by these presents do give and grant for us and our heirs to our well-beloved john gabbett citizen of venice to lose sebastian and santius sons of the said john and to the heirs of them and every of them and their deputies full and free authority leave and power to sail to all parts countries and seas of the east of the west and of the north under our banners and ensigns with five ships of what burden or quantity soever they be and as many mariners or men as they will have with them in the said ships upon their own proper costs and charges to seek out discover and find whatsoever isles countries regions or provinces of the heathens and infidels whatsoever they be and in what part of the world soever they be which before this time have been unknown to all christians we have granted to them also and to every of them the heirs of them and every of them and their deputies and have given them license to set up our banners and ensigns in every village town castle isle or mainland of them newly found and that the aforesaid john and his sons or their heirs and assigns may subdue occupy and possess all such towns cities castles and isles of them found which they can subdue occupy and possess as our vassals and lieutenants getting unto us the rule title and jurisdiction of the same villages towns castles and firm land so found the patent then goes on to provide for a royalty to his majesty of one-fifth of the net profits to exempt the patentees from custom duty to exclude competition and to exhort good subjects of the crown to help the cabots in every possible way the first of all english documents connected with america ends with these words witness ourself at westminster the fifth day of march in the eleventh year of our re reign henry r to sail to all parts of the east of the west and of the north the pointed omission of the word south made it clear that henry had no intention of infringing spanish rights of discovery spanish claims however were based on the pope's division of all the heathen world and were by no means bounded by any rights of discovery already acquired cabot left bristol in the spring of fourteen hundred and ninety seven a year after the date of his patent not with the five ships the king had authorized but in the little matthew with a crew of only eighteen men nearly all englishmen accustomed to the north atlantic the matthew made cape breton the easternmost point of nova scotia on the twenty fourth of june the anniversary of st john the baptist now the racial fete day of the french canadians not a single human inhabitant was to be seen in this wild new land shaggy with forests primeval fronted with bold scarped shores and beautiful with romantic deep bays leading inland league upon league past rugged forelands and rocky battlements keeping guard at the frontiers of the continent over these mysterious wilds cabot raised st george's cross for england and the banner of st mark in souvenir of venice 
had he now reached the fabled islands of the west or discovered other islands off the eastern coast of tartary he did not know but he hurried back to bristol with the news and was welcomed by the king and people a venetian in london wrote home to say that this fellow-citizen of ours who went from bristol in quest of new islands is juan cabato whom the english now call a great admiral he dresses in silk they pay him great honour and every one runs after him like mad the spanish ambassador was full of suspicion in spite of the fact that cabot had not gone south had not his holiness divided all heathendom between the crowns of spain and portugal to spain the west and to portugal the east and was not this landfall within what the modern world would call the spanish sphere of influence the ambassador protested to henry the seventh and reported home to ferdinand and isabella henry the seventh meanwhile sent a little present to him that found the new isle ten pounds it was not very much but it was about as much as nearly a thousand dollars now and it meant full recognition and approval this was a good start for a man who couldn't pay the king any royalty of twenty per cent because he hadn't made a penny on the way besides it was followed up by a royal annuity of twice the amount and by renewed letters patent for further voyages and discoveries in the west so cabot took good fortune at the flood and went again this time there was the full authorized flotilla of five sail of which one turned back and four sailed on somewhere on the way john cabot disappeared from history and his second son sebastian reigned in his stead sebastian like john apparently wrote nothing whatever but he talked a great deal and in after years he seems to have remembered a good many things that never happened at all nevertheless he was a very able man in several capacities and could teach a courtier or a demagogue as well as a geographer or explorer of new claims the art of climbing over other people's backs his father's and his brother's backs included he had his troubles for king henry had pressed upon him recruits from the jails which just then were full of rebels but he had enough seamen to manage the ships and plenty of cargo for trade with the undiscovered natives sebastian perhaps left some of his three hundred men to explore newfoundland he knew they couldn't starve because as he often used to tell his gaping listeners the waters thereabouts were so thick with codfish that he had hard work to force his vessels through this first of american fish stories wildly improbable as it may seem may yet have been founded on fact when acres upon acres of the countless little capelins swim inshore to feed and they themselves are preyed on by leaping acres of voracious cod whose own rear ranks are being preyed on by hungry seals sharks herring hogs or dogfish then indeed the troubled surface of a narrowing bay is literally thick with the silvery flash of capelin the dark tumultuous backs of cod and the swirling rushes of the greater beasts of prey behind nor were certain other fish stories told by sebastian and his successors about the land of cod without some strange truths to build on cod have been caught as long as a man and weighing over a hundred pounds a whole hare a big Willemo with his beak and claws a brace of duck so fresh that they must have been swallowed alive a rubber wading boot and a very learned treatise complete in three volumes these are a few of the curiosities actually found in sundry stomachs of the all-devouring cod the new-found cod banks were a mine of wealth for western europe at a time when every one ate fish on fast days they have remained so ever since because the enormous increase of population has kept up a constantly increasing demand for natural supplies of food basques and english spaniards french and portuguese were presently fishing for cod all round the waters of northeastern north america and were even then beginning to raise questions of national rights that have only been settled in this twentieth century after four hundred years following the coast of greenland past cape farewell sebastian cabot turned north to look for the nearest course to india and cathay the lands of silks and spices diamonds rubies pearls and gold 
john cabot had once been as far as mecca or its neighbourhood where he had seen the caravans that came across the desert of arabia from the fabled east believing the proof that the world was round he like columbus and so many more thought america was either the eastern limits of the old world or an archipelago between the extremest east and west already known thus in the early days before it was valued for itself america was commonly regarded as a mere obstruction to navigation the more solid the more exasperating now in fourteen hundred and ninety eight on his second voyage to america john cabot must have been particularly anxious to get through and show the king some better return for his money but he simply disappears and all we know is what various writers gleaned from his son sebastian later on sebastian said he coasted greenland through vast quantities of midsummer ice until he reached sixty seven degrees thirty minutes north where there was hardly any night then he turned back and probably steered a southerly course for newfoundland as he appears to have completely missed what would have seemed to him the tempting way to asia offered by hudson strait and bay passing newfoundland he stood on south as far as the virginia capes perhaps down as far as florida a few natives were caught but no real trade was done and when the explorers had reported progress to the king the general opinion was that north america was nothing to boast of after all a generation later the french sent out several expeditions to sail through north america and make discoveries by the way jacques cartier's second made in fifteen hundred and thirty five was the greatest and most successful he went up the st lawrence as high as the site of montreal the head of ocean navigation where a hundred and forty years later the local wits called la salle's seigneurie la chine in derision of his unquenchable belief in a transcontinental connection with cathay but that was under the wholly new conditions of the seventeenth century when both french and english expected to make something out of what are now the united states and canada the point of the wilting joke against la salle was a new version of the old adage go farther and fare worse the point of european opinion about america throughout the wonderful sixteenth century was that those who did go farther north than mexico were certain to fare worse and whatever the cause they generally did so there was yet a third reason why the fame of columbus eclipsed the fame of the cabots even among those english-speaking peoples whose new world home the cabots were the first to find to begin with columbus was the first of moderns to discover any spot in all america secondly while the cabots gave no writings to the world columbus did he wrote for a mighty monarch and his fame was spread abroad by what we should now call a monster publicity campaign thirdly our present point the southern lands associated with columbus and with spain yielded immense and most romantic profits during the most romantic period of the sixteenth century the northern lands connected with the cabots did nothing of the kind priority publicity and romantic wealth all favoured columbus and the south then as the memory of them does to-day the four hundredth anniversary of his discovery of an island in the bahamas excited the interest of the whole world and was celebrated with great enthusiasm in the united states the four hundredth anniversary of the cabot's discovery of north america excited no interest at all outside of bristol and cape breton and a few learned societies even contemporary spain did more for the cabots than that the spanish ambassador in london carefully collected every scrap of information and sent it home to his king who turned it over as material for juan de la cosa's famous map the first dated map of america known this map made in fifteen hundred on a bullock's hide still occupies a place of honour in the naval museum at madrid and there it stands as a contemporary geographic record to show that st george's cross was the first flag ever raised over eastern north america at all events north of cape hatteras the cabots did great things though they were not great men john as we have seen already sailed out of the can of man in fourteen hundred and ninety eight during his second voyage sly sebastian lived on and almost saw elizabeth 
ascend the throne in fifteen hundred and fifty eight he had made many voyages and served many masters in the meantime in fifteen hundred and twelve he entered the service of king ferdinand of spain as a captain of the sea with a handsome salary attached six years later the emperor charles v made him chief pilot and examiner of pilots another six years and he is sitting as a nautical assessor to find out the longitude of the moluccas in order that the pope may know whether they fall within the portuguese or spanish hemisphere of exploitation presently he goes on a four years journey to south america is hindered by a mutiny explores the river plate la plata and returns in fifteen hundred and thirty about the time of the voyage to brazil of master william hawkins of which we shall hear later on in fifteen hundred and forty four sebastian made an excellent and celebrated map of the world which gives a wonderfully good idea of the coasts of north america from labrador to florida this map long given up for lost and only discovered three centuries after it had been finished is now in the national library in paris sebastian had passed his threescore years and ten before this famous map appeared but he was as active as ever twelve years later again he had left spain for england in fifteen hundred and forty eight to the rage of charles v who claimed him as a deserter which he probably was but the english boy king edward the sixth gave him a pension which was renewed by queen mary and his last ten years were spent in england where he died in the odour of sanctity as governor of the muscovy company and citizen of london whatever his faults he was a hearty good fellow with his boon companions and the following personal mention about his octogenarian revels at gravesend is well worth quoting exactly as the admiring diarist wrote it down on the twenty seventh of april fifteen hundred and fifty six when the pinnace search thrift was on the point of sailing to muscovy and the directors were giving it a great send-off after master kubota and divers gentlemen and gentlewomen had viewed our pinnace and tasted of such cheer as we could make them aboard they went on shore giving to our mariners right liberal rewards and the good old gentleman master kubota gave to the poor most liberal alms wishing them to pray for the good fortune and prosperous success of the search thrift our pinnace and then at the sign of the christopher he and his friends banqueted and made me and them that were in the company great cheer and for very joy that he had to see the towardness of our intended discovery he entered into the dance himself amongst the rest of the young and lusty company which being ended he and his friends departed most gently commending us to the governance of almighty god end of chapter one chapter two of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two henry the eighth king of the english sea the leading pioneers in the age of discovery were sons of italy spain and portugal cabot as we have seen was an italian though he sailed for the english crown and had an english crew columbus too was an italian though in the service of the spanish crown it was the portuguese vasco da gama who in the very year of john cabot's second voyage fourteen hundred and ninety eight found the great sea route to india by way of the cape of good hope two years later the corderials also portuguese began exploring the coasts of america as far northwest as labrador twenty years later again the portuguese magellan sailing for the king of spain discovered the strait still known by his name passed through it into the pacific and reached the philippines there he was killed but one of his ships went on to make the first circumnavigation of the globe a feat which redounded to the glory of both spain and portugal meanwhile in fifteen hundred and thirteen the spaniard balboa had crossed the isthmus of panama and waded into the pacific sword in hand to claim it for the king then came the spanish explorers ponce de leon de soto coronado and many more and later on the conquerors and founders of new spain cortez pizarro and their successors 
during all this time neither france nor england made any lodgment in america though both sent out a number of expeditions both fished on the cod banks of newfoundland and each had already marked out her own sphere of influence the portuguese were in brazil the spaniards in south and central america england by right of the bristol voyages claimed the eastern coasts of the united states and canada france in virtue of cartier's discovery the region of the st lawrence but while new spain and new portugal flourished in the sixteenth century new france and new england were yet to rise in the sixteenth century both france and england were occupied with momentous things at home france was torn with religious wars tudor england had much work to do before any effective english colonies could be planted oversea dominions are nothing without sufficient sea-power naval and mercantile to win to hold and foster them but tudor england was gradually forming those naval and merchant services without which there could have been neither british empire nor united states henry the eighth had faults which have been trumpeted about the world from his own day to ours but of all english sovereigns he stands foremost as the monarch of the sea young handsome learned exceedingly accomplished gloriously strong in body and in mind henry mounted the throne in fifteen hundred and nine with the hearty good will of nearly all his subjects before england could become the mother country of an empire overseas she had to shake off her mediaeval weaknesses become a strong unified modern state and arm herself against any probable combination of hostile foreign states happily for herself and for her future colonists henry was richly endowed with strength and skill for his task with one hand he welded england into political unity crushing disruptive forces by the way with the other he gradually built up a fleet the like of which the world had never seen he had the advantage of being more independent of parliamentary supplies than any other sovereign from his thrifty father he had inherited what was then an almost fabulous sum nine million dollars in cash from what his friends call the conversion and his enemies the spoliation of church property in england he obtained many millions more moreover the people as a whole always rallied to his call whenever he wanted other national resources for the national defence henry's unique distinction is that he effected the momentous change from an ancient to a modern fleet this supreme achievement constitutes his real title to the lasting gratitude of english-speaking peoples his first care when he came to the throne in fifteen hundred and nine was for the safety of the broad ditch as he called the english channel his last great act was to establish in fifteen hundred forty six the office of the admiralty and marine affairs during the thirty-seven years between his accession and the creation of this navy board the pregnant change was made king henry loved a man he had an unerring eye for choosing the right leaders he delighted in everything to do with ships and shipping he mixed freely with naval men and merchant skippers visited the dockyards promoted several improved types of vessels and always befriended fletcher of rye the shipwright who discovered the art of tacking and thereby revolutionized navigation nor was the king only a patron he invented a new type of vessel himself and thoroughly mastered scientific gunnery he was the first of national leaders to grasp the full significance of what could be done by broadsides fired from saving ships against the mediaeval type of vessel that still depended more on oars than on sails henry's maritime rivals were the two greatest monarchs of continental europe francis i of france and charles v of spain henry francis and charles were all young all ambitious and all exceedingly capable men henry had the fewest subjects charles by far the most francis had a compact kingdom well situated for a great european land power henry had one equally well situated for a great european sea power charles ruled vast dominions scattered over both the new world and the old the destinies of mankind turn mostly on the rivalry between these three protagonists and their successors charles v was heir to several crowns he ruled spain the netherlands the kingdom of the two sicilies and important principalities in northern italy 
he was elected emperor of germany he owned enormous overseas dominions in africa and the two americas soon became new spain he governed each part of his european dominions by a different title and under a different constitution he had no fixed imperial capital but moved about from place to place a legitimate sovereign everywhere and for the most part a popular one as well it was his son philip the second who failing of election as emperor lived only in spain concentrated the machinery of government in madrid and became so unpopular elsewhere charles had been brought up in flanders he was genial in the flemish way and he understood his various states in the netherlands which furnished him with one of his main sources of revenue another much larger source of revenue poured in its wealth to him later on in rapidly increasing volume from north and south america charles had inherited a long and bitter feud with france about the burgundian dominions on the french side of the rhine and about domains in italy besides which there were many points of violent rivalry between things french and spanish england also had hereditary feuds with france which had come down from the hundred years war and which had ended in her almost final expulsion from france less than a century before scotland nursing old feuds against england and always afraid of absorption naturally sided with france portugal small and open to spanish invasion by land was more or less bound to please spain during the many campaigns between francis and charles the english channel swarmed with men of war privateers and downright pirates sometimes england took a hand officially against france but even when england was not officially at war many englishmen were privateers and not a few were pirates never was there a better training school of fighting seamanship than in and around the narrow seas it was a continual struggle for an existence in which only the fittest survived quickness was essential consequently vessels that could not increase their speed were soon cleared off the sea spain suffered a good deal by this continuous raiding so did the netherlands but such was the power of charles that although his navies were much weaker than his armies he yet was able to fight by sea on two enormous fronts first in the mediterranean against the turks and other moslems secondly in the channel and along the coast all the way from antwerp to cadiz nor did the left arm of his power stop there for his fleets his transports and his merchantmen ranged the coasts of both americas from one side of the present united states right round to the other such in brief was the position of maritime europe when henry found himself menaced by the three roman catholic powers of scotland france and spain in fifteen hundred and thirty three he had divorced his first wife catherine of aragon thereby defying the pope and giving offence to spain he had again defied the pope by suppressing the monasteries and severing the church of england from the roman discipline the pope had struck back with a bull of excommunication designed to make henry the common enemy of catholic europe henry had been steadily building ships for years now he redoubled his activity he blooded the fathers of his daughter's sea-dogs by smashing up a pirate fleet and sinking a flotilla of flemish privateers the mouth of the scheldt in fifteen hundred and thirty nine was full of vessels ready to take a hostile army into england but such a fighting fleet prepared to meet them that henry's enemies forbore to strike in fifteen hundred and thirty nine too came the discovery of the art of tacking by fletcher of rye henry's shipwright friend a discovery forever memorable in the annals of seamanship never before had any kind of craft been sailed a single foot against the wind the primitive dugout on which the prehistoric savage hoisted the first semblance of a sail the ships of tarshish the roman transport in which st paul was wrecked and the spanish caravels with which columbus sailed to worlds unknown were in principle of navigation all the same but now fletcher ran out his epoch-making vessel with sails trimmed fore and aft and dumbfounded all the shipping in the channel by beating his way to windward against a good stiff breeze this achievement marked the dawn of the modern sailing age and so it happened that in fifteen hundred and forty five henry with a new-born modern fleet was able to turn defiantly on francis 
the english people rallied magnificently to his call what was at that time an enormous army covered the lines of advance on london but the fleet though employing fewer men was relatively a much more important force than the army and with the fleet went henry's own headquarters his lifelong interest in his navy now bore the first fruits of really scientific sea-power on an oceanic scale there was no great naval battle to fix general attention on one dramatic moment henry's strategy and tactics however were new and full of promise he repeated his strategy of the previous war by sending out a strong squadron to attack the base at which the enemy's ships were then assembling and he definitely committed the english navy alone among all the navies in the world to sailing ship tactics instead of continuing those founded on the rowing galley of immemorial fame the change from a sort of floating army to a really naval fleet from galleys moved by oars and depending on boarders who were soldiers to ships moved by sails and depending on their broadside guns this change was quite as important as the change in the nineteenth century from sails and smooth bores to steam and rifled ordnance it was indeed from at least one commanding point of view much more important for it meant that england was easily first in developing the only kind of navy which would count in any struggle for over sea dominion after the discovery of america had made sea power no longer a question of coasts and landlocked waters but of all the outer oceans of the world the year that saw the birth of modern sea power is a date to be remembered in this history for fifteen hundred and forty five was also the year in which the mines of potosi first aroused the old world to the riches of the new it was the year too in which sir francis drake was born moreover there was another significant birth in this same year the parole aboard the portsmouth fleet was god save the king the answering countersign was long to reign over us these words formed the nucleus of the national anthem now sung round all the seven seas the anthems of other countries were born on land god save the king sprang from the navy and the sea the reformation quickened sea-faring life in many ways after henry's excommunication every roman catholic crew had full papal sanction for attacking every english crew that would not submit to rome no matter how catholic its faith might be thus in addition to danger from pirates privateers and men-of-war an english merchantman had to risk attack by any one who was either passionately roman or determined to use religion as a cloak raids and reprisals grew apace the english were by no means always lambs in piteous contrast to the papal wolves rather it might be said they took a motto from this true russian proverb make yourself a sheep and you'll find no lack of wolves but rightly or wrongly the general english view was that the papal attitude was one of attack while their own was one of defence papal europe of course thought quite the reverse henry died in fifteen hundred and forty seven and the lord protector somerset at once tried to make england as protestant as possible during the minority of edward the sixth who was not yet ten years old this brought every english seaman under suspicion in every spanish port where the holy office of the inquisition was a great deal more vigilant and business-like than the custom-house or harbour-master inquisitors had seized englishmen in henry's time but charles had stayed their hand now that the ruler of england was an open heretic who appeared to reject the accepted forms of catholic belief as well as the papal forms of roman discipline the hour had come to strike war would have followed in ordinary times but the reformation had produced a cross division among the subjects of all the great powers if charles went to war with a protestant lord protector of england then some of his own subjects in the netherlands would probably revolt france had her huguenots england her ultra papists scotland some of both kinds every country had an unknown number of enemies at home and friends abroad all feared war somerset neglected the navy but the seafaring men among the protestants as among those catholics who were anti-roman took to privateering more than ever nor was exploration forgotten a group of merchant adventurers sent sir hugh willoughby to find the northeast passage to cathay willoughby's three ships were towed down the thames by oarsmen dressed in sky-blue jackets as they passed the palace at greenwich they dipped their colours in salute 
but the poor young king was too weak to come to the window willoughby met his death in lapland but chancellor his second in command got through to the white sea pushed on overland to moscow and returned safe in fifteen hundred and fifty four when queen mary was on the throne next year strange to say the charter of the new muscovy company was granted by philip of armada fame now joint sovereign of england with his newly married wife soon to be known as bloody mary one of the directors of the company was lord howard of effingham father of drake's lord admiral while the governor was our old friend sebastian cabot now in his eightieth year philip was crown prince of the spanish empire and his father charles v was very anxious that he should please the stubborn english for if he could only become both king of england and emperor of germany he would rule the world by sea as well as land philip did his ineffective best drank english beer in public as if he liked it and made his stately spanish courtiers drink it too and smile he spent spanish gold brought over from america and he got the convenient kind of englishmen to take it as spy money for many years to come but with it he likewise sowed some dragon's teeth the english sea-dogs never forgot the iron chests of spanish new world gold and presently began to wonder whether there was no sure way in far america by which to get it for themselves in the same year fifteen hundred and fifty five the marian attack on english heretics began and the sea became safer than the land for those who held strong anti-papal views the royal navy was neglected even more than it had been lately by the lord protector but fighting traitors privateers and pirates multiplied the seaports were hotbeds of hatred against mary philip papal rome and spanish inquisition in fifteen hundred and fifty six sebastian cabot reappears genial and prosperous as ever and dances out of history at the sailing of the search thrift bound northeast for muscovy in fifteen hundred and fifty seven philip came back to england for the last time and manoeuvred her into a war which cost her calais the last english foothold on the soil of france during this war an english squadron joined philip's vessels in a victory over the french off gravelines where drake was to fight the armada thirty years later this first of the two battles fought at gravelines brings us down to fifteen hundred and fifty eight the year in which mary died elizabeth succeeded her and a very different english age began End of chapter two chapter three of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three life afloat in tudor times two stories from hacklet's voyages will illustrate what sort of work the english were attempting in america about fifteen hundred and thirty near the middle of king henry's reign the success of master hawkins and the failure of master hoare are quite typical of several other adventures in the new world old mr william hawkins of plymouth a man for his wisdom valour experience and skill in sea causes much esteemed and beloved of king henry the eighth and being one of the principal sea captains in the west parts of england in his time not contented with the short voyages commonly then made only to the known coasts of europe armed out a tall and goodly ship of his own of the burthen of two hundred and fifty tons called the pole of plymouth wherewith he made three long and famous voyages unto the coast of brazil a thing in those days very rare especially to our nation hawkins first went down the guinea coast of africa where he trafficked with the negroes and took of them oliphants teeth and other commodities which that place yieldeth and so arriving on the coast of brazil used there such discretion and behaved himself so wisely with those savage people that he grew into great familiarity and friendship with them insomuch that in his second voyage one of the savage kings of the country of brazil was contented to take ship with him and to be transported hither into england this king was presented unto king henry the eighth 
the king and all the nobility did not a little marvel for in his cheeks were holes and therein small bones planted which in his country was reputed for a great bravery the poor brazilian monarch died on his voyage back which made hawkins fear for the life of martin cockerham whom he had left in brazil as a hostage however the brazilians took hawkins's word for it and released cockerham who lived another forty years in plymouth old mr william hawkins was the father of sir john hawkins drake's companion in arms whom we shall meet later he was also the grandfather of sir richard hawkins another naval hero and of the second william hawkins one of the founders of the greatest of all chartered companies the honourable east india company hawkins knew what he was about master hoare did not hoare was a well-meaning plausible fellow good at taking up new-fangled ideas bad at carrying them out and the very cut of a wildcat company promoter except for his honesty he persuaded divers young lawyers of the inns of court and chancery to go to newfoundland a hundred and twenty men set off in this modern ship of fools which ran into newfoundland at night and was wrecked there were no provisions and none of the divers lawyers seems to have known how to catch a fish after trying to live on wild fruit they took to eating each other in spite of master hoare who stood up boldly and warned them of the fire to come just then a french fishing smack came in whereupon the lawyers seized her put her wretched crew ashore and sailed away with all the food she had the outraged frenchman found another vessel chased the lawyers back to england and laid their case before the king who out of his royal bounty reimbursed the frenchman and let the divers lawyers go scot-free hawkins and hoare and others like them were the heroes of travellers tales but what was the ordinary life of the sailor who went down to the sea in the ships of the tudor age there are very few quite authentic descriptions of life afloat before the end of the sixteenth century and even then we rarely see the ship and crew about their ordinary work everybody was all agog for marvellous discoveries nobody least of all a seaman bothered his head about describing the daily routine on board we know however that it was a lot of almost incredible hardship only the fittest could survive elizabethan landsmen may have been quite as prone to mistake comfort for civilization as most of the world is said to be now elizabethan sailors when afloat most certainly were not and for the simple reason that there was no such thing as real comfort in a ship here are a few verses from the oldest genuine english sea-song known they were written down in the fifteenth century before the discovery of america and were probably touched up a little by the scribe the original manuscript is now in trinity college cambridge it is a true nautical composition a very rare thing indeed for genuine sea-songs didn't often get into print and weren't enjoyed by landsmen when they did the setting is that of a merchantman carrying passengers whose discomforts rather amuse the shipmen anon the master commandeth fast to his shipmen in all the hasta to dress them line up soon about the mast their takling to make with how hissa then they cry what how mate thou standest too nigh thy fellow may not haul thee by thus they begin to crake shout a boy or twain anon upstain go aloft and over thwart the sail-yard lane lie ye how talia the remnant cryin cry and pull with all their might bestow the boat boatswain anon that our pilgrims may play thereon for some are like to cough and groan ere it be full midnight haul the bowline now veer the sheet cook may ready anon our meat our pilgrims have no lust to eat i pray god give them rest go to the helm what ho no nearer steward fellow a pot of beer 
ye shall have sir with good cheer anon all of the best ye how trussa haul in the brails thou haulest not by god thou failsest o oh, see how well our good ship sails and thus they say among this meanwhile the pilgrims lie and have their bowls all fast them by and cry after hot malvesai their health for to restore some lay their books on their knee and read so long they cannot see alas mine head will split in three thus saith one poor wight a sack of straw were there right good for some must lay them in their hood i had as lief be in the wood without or meat or drink for when that we shall go to bed the pump is nigh our bed is head a man he were as good be dead as smell there of the stink how hissa is still used aboard deep water men as ho hissa instead of ho hoist away what ho made is also known afloat though dying out ye how talia is yo yo tally or tally and belay which means hauling aft and making fast the sheet of a mainsail or foresail what ho no nearer is what ho no higher now but old salts remember no nearer and it may be still extant sea-sickness seems to have been the same as ever so was the desperate effort to pretend one was not really feeling it and cry after hot malvesi their health for to restore here is another sea song one sung by the sea dogs themselves the doubt is whether the martial men are navy men as distinguished from merchant service men aboard a king's ship or whether they are soldiers who want to take all sailors down a peg or two this seems the more probable explanation soldiers ranked sailors afloat in the sixteenth century and drake's was the first fleet in the world in which seamen admirals were allowed to fight a purely naval action we be three poor mariners newly come from the seas we spend our lives in jeopardy while others live at ease we care not for those martial men that do our states disdain but we care for those merchant men that do our states maintain a third old sea song gives voice to the universal complaint that landsmen cheat sailors who come home flush of gold for sailors they be honest men and they do take great pains but landmen and ruffling lads do rob them of their gains here too is some cordial advice against the wiles of the sea addressed to all rash young men who think to advance their decaying fortunes by navigation as most of the sea-dogs and gentlemen adventurers like gilbert raleigh and cavendish tried to do you merchant men of billingsgate i wonder how you thrive you bargain with men for six months and pay them but for five this was an abuse that took a long time to die out even well on in the nineteenth century and sometimes even on board of steamers victualling was only by the lunar month though service went by the calendar a cursed cat with thrice three tails doth much increase our woe is a poetical way of putting another's seaman's grievance people who regret that there is such a discrepancy between genuine sea-songs and shore-going imitations will be glad to know that the mermaid is genuine though the usual air to which it was sung afloat was harsh and decidedly inferior to the one used ashore this example of the old four bitters so called because sung from the four bits a convenient mass of stout timbers near the foremast did not luxuriate in the repetitions of its shore-going rival with a comb and a glass in her hand her hand her hand etc solo on friday morn as we set sail it was not far from land oh there i spied a fair pretty maid with a comb and a glass in her hand chorus the stormy winds did blow and the raging seas did roar while we poor sailors went to the tops and the landlubbers laid below the anonymous author of a curious composition entitled the complaint of scotland written in fifteen hundred and forty eight seems to be the only man who took more interest in the means than in the ends of seamanship he was undoubtedly a landsman but he loved the things of the sea and his work is well worth reading as a vocabulary of the lingo that was used on board a tudor ship 
when the seamen sang it sounded like an echo in a cave many of the outlandish words were mediterranean terms which the scientific italian navigators had brought north others were of oriental origin which was very natural in view of the long connection between east and west at sea admiral for instance comes from the arabic for a commander-in-chief amir al bar means commander of the sea most of the nautical technicalities would strike a seaman of the present day as being quite modern the sixteenth-century skipper would be readily understood by a twentieth-century helmsman in the case of such orders as these keep full and by luff connor steady keep close our modern sailor in the navy however would be hopelessly lost in trying to follow directions like the following make ready your cannons middle culverins bastard culverins falcons sakers slings headsticks murderous passivolants bazils dogs crook arquebuses calivers and hail shot another look at life afloat in the sixteenth century brings us once more into touch with america for the old sea-dog directions for the taking of a prize were admirably summed up in the seaman's grammar which was compiled by captain john smith sometime governor of virginia and admiral of new england pocahontas smith in fact a sail how bears she to windward or leeward set him by the compass he stands right ahead or on the weather bow or lee bow let fly your colours if you have a consort else not out with all your sails a steady man at the helm give him chase he holds his own no we gather on him captain out goes his flag and pendants also his waist cloths and top armings which is a long red cloth that goeth round about the ship on the outsides of all her upper works and fore and main tops as well for the countenance and grace of the ship as to cover the men from being seen he furls and slings his main yard in goes his sprit sail thus they strip themselves into their fighting sails which his only the foresail the main and fore top sails because the rest should not be fired nor spoiled besides they would be troublesome to handle hinder our sights and the using of our arms he makes ready his close fights fore and aft bulkheads set up to cover men under fire every man to his charge douse your topsail to salute him for the sea hail him with a noise of trumpets whence is your ship of spain whence is yours of england are you merchants or men of war we are of the sea he waves us to leeward with his drawn sword calls out amain for the king of spain and springs his luff brings his vessel close by the wind give him a chase piece with your broadside and run a good berth ahead of him done done we have the wind of him and now he tacks about tack about also and keep your luff be yare at the helm edge in with him give him a volley of small shot also your prow and broadside as before and keep your luff he pays us shot for shot well we shall requite him edge in with him again begin with your bow pieces proceed with your broadside and let her fall off with the wind to give him also your full chase your weather broadside and bring her round so that the stern may also discharge and your tacks close aboard again the wind veers the sea goes too high to board her and we are shot through and through and between wind and water try the pump bear up the helm sling a man overboard to stop the leaks that is truss him up around the middle in a piece of canvas and a rope with his arms at liberty with a mallet and plugs lapped in oakum and well tarred and a tarpaulin clout which he will quickly beat into the holes the bullets made what cheer mates is all well all's well then make ready to bear up with him again with all your great and small shot charge him board him thwart the hawes on the bow midships or rather than fail on his quarter or make fast your grapplings to his close fights and sheer off which would tear his cover down captain we are foul of each other and the ship is on fire cut anything to get clear and smother the fire with wet cloths in such a case they will be presently such friends as to help one the other all they can to get clear lest they should both burn together and so sink and if they be generous and the fire be quenched they will drink kindly one to the other heave their cans overboard and begin again as before chirurgeon look to the wounded and wind up the slain 
and give them three guns for their funerals swabber make clean the ship purser record their names watch be vigilant to keep your berth to windward that we lose him not in the night gunners sponge your ordnance soldiers scour your pieces carpenters about your leaks boatswain and the rest repair sails and shrouds cook see you observe your directions against the morning watch boy hello is the kettle boiled ay ay sir boatswain call up the men to prayer and breakfast always have as much care to their wounded as to your own and if there be either young women or aged men use them nobly sound drums and trumpets st george for merry england end of chapter three yeah. chapter four of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four elizabethan england elizabethan england is the motherland the true historic home of all the different peoples who speak the sea-born english tongue in the reign of elizabeth there was only one english speaking nation this nation consisted of a bare five million people fewer than there are to-day in london or new york but hardly had the great queen died before englishmen began that colonizing movement which has carried their language the whole world round and established their civilization in every quarter of the globe within three centuries after elizabeth's day the use of english as a native speech had grown quite thirtyfold within the same three centuries the number of those living under laws and institutions derived from england had grown a hundredfold the england of elizabeth was an england of great deeds but of greater dreams elizabethan literature take it for all in all has never been surpassed myriad-minded shakespeare remains unequalled still elizabethan england was indeed a nest of singing birds prose was often far too pedestrian for the exultant life of such a mighty generation as new worlds came into their expectant ken the glowing elizabethans wished to fly there on the soaring wings of verse to them the tide of fortune was no ordinary stream but the white-maned proud neck-arching tide that bore adventures to sea with pomp of waters unwithstood the goodly heritage that england gave her offspring overseas included shakespeare and the english bible the authorized version entered into the very substance of early american life there was a marked difference between episcopalian virginia and puritan new england but both took their stand on this version of the english bible in which the springs of holy writ rejoiced to run through channels of elizabethan prose it is true that elizabeth slept with her fathers before this book of books was printed and that the first of the stuarts reigned in her stead nevertheless the authorized version is pure elizabethan all its translators were elizabethans as their dedication to king james still printed with every copy gratefully acknowledges in its reference to the setting of that bright occidental star queen elizabeth of most happy memory these words of the reverend scholars contain no empty compliment elizabeth was a great sovereign and in some essential particulars a very great national leader this daughter of henry the eighth and his second wife anne boleyn the debonair was born a heretic in fifteen hundred and thirty three her father was then defying both spain and the pope within three years after her birth her mother was beheaded and by act of parliament elizabeth herself was declared illegitimate she was fourteen when her father died leaving the kingdom to his three children in succession elizabeth being the third then followed the protestant reign of the boy king edward the sixth during which elizabeth enjoyed security then the catholic reign of her spanish half-sister bloody mary during which her life hung by the merest thread at first however mary concealed her hostility to elizabeth because she thought the two daughters of henry the eighth ought to appear together in her triumphal entry into london 
from one point of view and a feminine one at that this was a fatal mistake on mary's part for never did elizabeth show to more advantage she was just under twenty while mary was nearly twice her age mary had indeed provided herself with one good foil in the person of anne of cleves the flemish mare whose flat coarse face and lumbering body had disgusted king henry thirteen years before when cromwell had foisted her upon him as his fourth wife but with poor fat straw-coloured anne on one side and black and sallow foreign-looking man-voiced mary on the other the thoroughly english princess elizabeth took london by storm on the spot tall and majestic she was a magnificent example of the finest anglo-norman type always the glass of fashion and then the very mould of form her splendid figure looked equally well on horseback or on foot a little full in the eye and with a slightly aquiline nose she appeared as she really was keenly observant and commanding though these two features just prevented her from being a beauty the bright blue eyes and the finely chiselled nose were themselves quite beautiful enough nor was she less taking to the ear than to the eye for in marked contrast to gruff foreign mary and wheezy foreign anne she had a rich clear though rather too loud english voice when the court reined up and dismounted elizabeth became even more the centre of attraction mary marched stiffly on anne plodded after but as for elizabeth perfect in dancing riding archery and all the sports of chivalry she trod the line like a buck in spring and looked like a lance in rest when elizabeth succeeded mary in the autumn of fifteen hundred and fifty eight she had dire need of all she had learnt in her twenty-five years of adventurous life fortunately for herself and on the whole most fortunately for both england and america she had a remarkable power of inspiring devotion to the service of their queen and country in men of both the cool and ardent types and this long after her personal charms had gone government religion finance defence and foreign affairs were in a perilous state of flux besides which they have never been more distractingly mixed up with one another henry the seventh had saved money for twenty-five years his three successors had spent it lavishly for fifty henry the eighth had kept the church catholic in ritual while making it purely national in government the lord protector somerset had made it as protestant as possible under edward the sixth mary had done her best to bring it back to the pope home affairs were full of doubts and dangers though the great mass of the people were ready to give their handsome young queen a fair chance and not a little favour foreign affairs were worse france was still the hereditary enemy and the loss of calais under mary had exasperated the whole english nation scotland was a constant menace in the north spain was gradually changing from friend to foe the pope was disinclined to recognize elizabeth at all to understand how difficult her position was we must remember what sort of constitution england had when the germ of the united states was forming the roman empire was one constituent whole from the emperor down the english-speaking peoples of to-day form constituent wholes from the electorate up in both cases all parts were and are in constant relation to the whole the case of elizabethan england however was very different there was neither despotic unity from above nor democratic unity from below but a mixed and fluctuating kind of government in which crown nobles parliament and people formed certain parts which had to be put together for each occasion the accepted general idea was that the sovereign supreme as an individual looked after the welfare of the country in peace and war so far as the crown estates permitted but that whenever the crown resources would not suffice then the sovereign could call on nobles and people for whatever the common weal required noblesse oblige in return for the estates or monopolies which they had acquired the nobles and favoured commoners were expected to come forward with all their resources at every national crisis precisely as the crown was expected to work for the commonweal at all times 
when the resources of the crown and favoured courtiers sufficed no parliament was called but whenever they had to be supplemented then parliament met and voted whatever it approved finally every english freeman was required to do his own share towards defending the country in time of need and he was further required to know the proper use of arms the great object of every european court during early modern times was to get both the old feudal nobility and the newly promoted commoners to revolve round the throne as round the centre of their solar system by sheer force of character for the tudors had no overwhelming army like the roman conquerors henry the eighth had succeeded wonderfully well elizabeth now had to piece together what had been broken under edward the sixth and mary she too succeeded and with the hearty good will of nearly all her subjects mary had left the royal treasury deeply in debt yet elizabeth succeeded in paying off all arrears and meeting new expenditure for defence and for the court the royal income rose england became immensely richer and more prosperous than ever before foreign trade increased by leaps and bounds home industries flourished and were stimulated by new arrivals from abroad because england was a safe asylum for the craftsmen whom philip was driving from the netherlands to his own great loss and his rival's gain english commercial life had been slowly emerging from mediaeval ways throughout the fifteenth century with the beginning of the sixteenth the rate of emergence had greatly quickened the soil-bound peasant who produced enough food for his family from his thirty acres was being gradually replaced by the well-to-do yeoman who tilled a hundred acres and upwards such holdings produced a substantial surplus for the market this increased the national wealth which in its turn increased both home and foreign trade the peasant merely raised a little wheat and barley kept a cow and perhaps some sheep the yeoman or tenant farmer had sheep enough for the wool trade besides some butter cheese and meat for the nearest growing town he began to garnish his cupboards with pewter and his joined beds with tapestry and silk hangings and his tables with carpets and fine napery he could even feast his neighbours and servants after shearing day with new-fangled foreign luxuries like dates mace raisins currants and sugar but elizabethan society presented striking contrasts in parts of england the practice of engrossing and enclosing holdings was increasing as sheep raising became more profitable than farming the tenants thus dispossessed either swelled the ranks of the vagabonds who infested the highways or sought their livelihood at sea or in london which provided the two best openings for adventurous young men the smaller provincial towns afforded them little opportunity for there the trades were largely in the hands of close corporations descended from the mediaeval craft guilds these were eventually to be swept away by the general trend of business their dissolution had indeed already begun for smart village craftsmen were even then forming the new industrial settlements from which most of the great manufacturing towns of england have sprung camden the historian found birmingham full of ringing anvils sheffield a town of great name for the smiths therein leeds renowned for cloth and manchester already a sort of cottonopolis though the cottons of those days were still made of wool there was a wages question then as now there were demands for a minimum living wage the influx of gold and silver from america had sent all prices soaring meat became almost prohibitive for the submerged tenth there was a rapidly submerging tenth beef rose from one cent a pound in the forties to four in fifteen hundred and eighty eight the year of the armada how would the lowest paid of craftsmen fare on twelve cents a day with butter at ten cents a pound efforts were made again and again to readjust the ratio between prices and wages but as a rule prices increased much faster than wages all these things the increase of surplus hands the high cost of living grievances about wages and interest tended to make the farms and workshops of england recruiting grounds for the sea and the young men would strike out for themselves as freighters traders privateers or downright pirates lured 
by the dazzling chance of great and sudden wealth the gamble of it was as potent then as now probably more potent still it was an age of wild speculation accompanied by all the usual evils that follow frenzied ways it was also an age of monopoly both monopoly and speculation sent recruits into the sea-dog ranks elizabeth would grant say to sir walter raleigh the monopoly of sweet wines raleigh would naturally want as much sweet wine imported as england could be induced to swallow so too would elizabeth who got the duty crews would be wanted for the monopolistic ships they would also be wanted for free trading vessels that is for the ships of the smugglers who underbid undersold and tried to overreach the monopolist who represented law though not quite justice but speculation ran to greater extremes than either monopoly or smuggling shakespeare's putter out of five for one was a typical elizabethan speculator exploiting the riskiest form of sea-dog trade for all and sometimes for more than all that it was worth a merchant adventurer would pay a capitalist say a thousand pounds as a premium to be forfeited if his ship should be lost but to be repaid by the capitalist fivefold to the merchant if it returned incredible as it may seem to us there were shrewd money-lenders always ready for this sort of deal in life or life and death insurance an eloquent testimony to the risks encountered in sailing unknown seas in the midst of well-known dangers marine insurance of the regular kind was of course a very different thing it was already of immemorial age going back certainly to mediaeval and probably to very ancient times all forms of insurance on land are mere mushrooms by comparison lloyd's had not been heard of but there were plenty of smart elizabethan underwriters already practising the general principles which were to be formally adopted two hundred years later in seventeen hundred and seventy nine at lloyd's coffee-house a policy taken out on the tiger immortalised by shakespeare would serve as a model still and what makes it all the more interesting is that the elizabethan underwriters calculated the tiger's chances at the very spot where the association known as lloyd's transacts its business to-day the royal exchange in london this in turn brings elizabeth herself upon the scene for when she visited the exchange which sir thomas gresham had built to let the merchants do their street work under cover she immediately grasped its full significance and caused it by an herald and a trumpet to be proclaimed the royal exchange the name it bears to-day an elizabethan might well be astonished by what he would see at any modern lloyd's yet he would find the same essentials for the british lloyd's like most of its foreign imitators is not a gigantic insurance company at all but an association of cautiously elected members who carry on their completely independent private business in daily touch with each other precisely as elizabethans did lloyd's method differs wholly from ordinary insurance instead of insuring vessel and cargo with a single company or man the owner puts his case before lloyd's and any member can then write his name underneath for any reasonable part of the risk the modern underwriter all the world over is the direct descendant of the elizabethan who wrote his name under the conditions of a given risk at sea joint stock companies were in one sense old when elizabethan men of business were young but the elizabethans developed them enormously going shares was doubtless prehistoric it certainly was ancient mediaeval and elizabethan but those who formerly went shares generally knew each other and something of the business too the favourite number of total shares was just sixteen there were sixteen land shares in a celtic household sixteen shares in scottish vessels not individually owned sixteen shares in the theatre by which shakespeare made his pile 
but sixteenths and even hundredths were put out of date when speculation on the grander scale began and the area of investment grew the new river company for supplying london with water had only a few shares then as it continued to have down to our own day when they stood at over a thousand times par the ulster plantation in ireland was more remote and appealed to more investors and on wider grounds sentimental grounds both good and bad included the virginia plantation was still more remote and risky and appealed to an ever-increasing number of the speculating public many an investor put money on america in much the same way as a factory hand to-day puts money on a horse he has never seen or has never heard of otherwise than as something out of which a lot of easy money can be made provided luck holds good the modern prospectus was also in full career under elizabeth who probably had a hand in concocting some of the most important specimens lord bacon wrote one describing the advantages of the newfoundland fisheries in terms which no promoter of the present day could better every type of prospectus was tried on the investing public some genuine many doubtful others as outrageous in their impositions on human credulity as anything produced in our own times the company promoter was abroad in london on change and at court what with royal favor social prestige general prosperity the new national eagerness to find vent for surplus commodities and above all the spirit of speculation fanned into flame by the real and fabled wonders of america what with all this the investing public could take its choice of going the limit in a hundred different and most alluring ways england was surprised at her own investing wealth the east india company raised eight million dollars with ease from a thousand shareholders and paid a first dividend of eighty seven and a half per cent spices pearls and silks came pouring into london and english goods found vent increasingly abroad vastly expanding business opportunities of course produced the spirit of the trust and a very much the same sort of trust that americans think so ultra modern now monopolies granted by the crown and the volcanic forces of widespread speculation prevented some of the abuses of the trust but there were elizabethan trusts for all that though many a promising scheme fell through the felt makers hat trust is a case in point they proposed buying up all the hats in the market so as to oblige all dealers to depend upon one central warehouse of course they issued a prospectus showing how every one concerned would benefit by this benevolent plan ben jonson and other playwrights were quick to seize the salient absurdities of such an advertisement in the staple of news jonson proposed a news trust to collect all the news of the world corner it classify it into authentic apocryphal barbarous gossip and so forth and then sell it for the sole benefit of the consumer in links to suit all purchases in the devil is an ass he is a little more outspoken we'll take in citizens commoners and aldermen to bear the charge and blow them off again like so many dead flies this was exactly what was at that very moment being done in the case of the alum trust all the leading characters of much more modern times were there already fitz dottrell ready to sell his estates in order to become his grace the duke of drowned land gilt head the london money-lender who lives by finding fools and my lady tailbush who pulls the social wires at court and so the game went on usually with the result explained by shakespeare's fisherman in pericles i marvel how the fishes live in the sea why as men do a land the great ones eat up the little ones the newcastle coal trade grew into something very like a modern american trust with the additional advantage of an authorized government monopoly so long as the agreed-upon duty was paid then there was the starch monopoly a very profitable one because starch was a new delight which soon enabled elizabethan fops to wear ruffled collars big enough to make their heads as one irreverent satirist exclaimed look like john baptists on a platter 
but america could not america defeat the machinations of all monopolies and other trusts wasn't america the land of actual gold and silver where there was plenty of room for every one there soon grew up a wild belief that you could tap america for precious metals almost as its indians tapped maple trees for sugar the mountains of bright stones were surely there peru and mexico were nothing to these only find them and get rich quick would be the order of the day for every true adventurer these mountains moved about in men's imaginations and on prospectors maps always ahead of the latest pioneer somewhere behind the back of beyond they and their glamour died hard even that staid geographer of a later day thomas jeffreys added to his standard atlas of america in seventeen hundred and sixty this item of information on the far northwest hereabouts are supposed to be the mountains of bright stones mentioned in the map of ye indian Akagak. speculation of the wildcat kind was bad but it was the seamy side of a praiseworthy spirit of enterprise monopoly seems worse than speculation and so in many ways it was but we must judge it by the custom of its age it was often unjust and generally obstructive but it did what neither the national government nor joint stock companies had yet learnt to do monopoly went by court favour and its rights were often scandalously let and sometimes sublet as well but on the whole the queen the court and the country really meant business and monopolists had either to deliver the goods or get out monopolists sold dispensations from unworkable laws which was sometimes a good thing and sometimes a bad they sold licenses for indulgence in forbidden pleasures not often harmless they thought out and collected all kinds of indirect taxation and had to face all the troubles that confront the framers of a tariff policy to-day most of all however in a rough and ready way they set a sort of civil service going they served as boards of trade departments of the interior customs inland revenue and so forth what crown and parliament either could not or would not do was farmed out to monopolists like speculation the system worked both ways and frequently for evil but like the british constitution though on a lower plane it worked a monopoly at home like those which we have been considering was endurable because it was a working compromise that suited existing circumstances more or less and that could be either mended or ended as time went on but a general foreign monopoly like spain's monopoly of america was quite unendurable could spain not only hold what she had discovered and was exploiting but also extend her sphere of influence over what she had not discovered spain said yes england said no the spaniards looked for tribute the english looked for trade in government in religion in business in everything the two great rivals were irreconcilably opposed thus the lists were set and sea-dog battles followed elizabeth was an exceedingly able woman of business and was practically president of all the great joint-stock companies engaged in oversea trade wherever a cargo could be bought or sold there went an english ship to buy or sell it whenever the authorities in foreign parts tried discrimination against english men or english goods the english sea-dogs growled and showed their teeth and if the foreigners persisted the sea-dogs bit them elizabeth was extravagant at court but not without state motives for at least a part of her extravagance a brilliant court attracted the upper classes into the orbit of the crown while it impressed the whole country with the sovereign's power courtiers favoured with monopolies had to spend their earnings when the state was threatened and might not the queen's vast profusion of jewellery be turned to account at a pinch elizabeth could not afford to be generous when she was young she grew to be stingy when she was old but she saved the state by sound finance as well as by arms in spite of all her pomps and vanity she had three thousand dresses and gorgeous ones at that during the course of her reign her bathroom was wainscotted with venetian mirrors so that she could see nine and ninety reflections of her very comely person as she dipped and splashed or dried her royal skin she set a hot pace for all the votaries of dress to follow all kinds of fashion came in from abroad with the rush of new-found wealth and so instead of being 
insanely beautiful they soon became insanely bizarre an englishman says harrison endeavouring to write of our attire gave over his travail and only drew the picture of a naked man since he could find no kind of garment that could please him any whiles together i am an englishman and naked i stand here musing in my mind what raiment i shall wear for now i will wear this and now i will wear that and now i will wear i cannot tell what except you see a dog in a doublet you shall not see any so disguised as are my countrymen of england women also do far exceed the likeness of our men what shall i say of their gala gascon to bear out their attire and make it fit plumb round but the wives of citizens and burgesses like all nouveaux riches were still more bizarre than the courtiers they cannot tell when or how to make an end being women in whom all kind of curiosity is to be seen in far greater measure than in women of higher calling i might name hues devised for the nonce verdoy twixt green and yellow peas porridge tawny popinjay blue and the devil in the head yet all this crude absurdity from the courtier to the carter was the glass reflecting the constantly increasing seaborne trade ever pushing farther afield under the stimulus and protection of the sea-dogs and the queen took precious good care that it all paid toll to her treasury through the customs so that she could have more money to build more ships and if her courtiers did stuff their breeches out with sawdust she took equally good care that each fighting man among them donned his uniform and raised his troops or fitted out his ships when the time was ripe for action End of chapter four